glorious angels. And this is chapter one. Against a gunmetal grey sky, a small plane was flying. Barely bigger than a hand glider, its two wings tilted and juddered in the force of the winds that tossed it this way and that. So violent and erratic was the progress that seen from afar it could easily have been mistaken for a leaf, but then a streak of light caught the edge of one of its propellers and flashed a regular code of brilliant motes that betrayed its mechanical nature. Zarazin Majd, frozen almost into insensibility on his precarious perch, felt his heart catch at the sight. The slight increase of motion made him wobble, and the leather harness holding him against the icy stone slipped a little as it took his weight. The pain of being forced to maintain one position for hours was outstanding, and the cold had numbed his hands and feet in spite of their fireweave wraps. As the plane battled closer, a figure could be seen sitting inside the light framework of the craft delicate body, their arms and legs working hard at various controls. The head was covered in a black leather helmet. Its full glass plate face shield reflected the storm clouds above the air tube which curled down like a slender black elephant trunk to the tanks behind the single seat. Wrestling hard with the levers, one leg thrust forwards, the other braced, the pilot struggled and cajoled the tiny craft in steady corrections towards the overgrown deck below Jarajin's ruined tower. The bees of the engine became a furious tiger, and the underside of the wings lit with a burst of arcane energy in pale purple as whoever it was applied maximum power in an attempt to stall their excessive speed. Success brought a sudden new series of terrifying angles of descent, and the plane zigged, yawed, and pitched as it dropped from the sky. Jarazin put down the glasses for a moment and quickly wiped their lenses again to be sure he would not miss the essential moment. Their heavy brass frames were cold and rigid against the bone of his eye sockets, and the shaking of his hands made him bang them clumsily, so pain shot through one cheekbone. But he found the airplane easily this time, huge and out of focus in his vision. He spun the dials as the plane flitted closer to the platform, where its landing circle was marked in weeds bursting through the stones, their lines vivid green against the yellow streaks where the rest had been sprayed dead. A gust of wind almost knocked him off his perch, and he clutched and gasped with his moment of sudden terror. The glasses fell heavily against the strap on his neck. He swore, 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 fumbling with his gloved dead fingers until he had them back in place. For a second, the view wavered crazily as a gust caught him, and he lost sight, but then he found the small shape again, the violet glowing already dying back until it was barely more than a silhouette against an ever-darkening sky. There was a moment when the tiny craft was suspended in the air above the deck, so still it might have hung there forever, propeller whirring, insect-like, fragile, and then, with the sudden relenting of the wind, it dropped like a stone to the burst pavement of the runway and landed heavily with a thud that Jarazin felt as well as heard. He found his heart in his mouth. He thought the pilot was surely going to die. The plane smashed into matches although identifying an unprotesting corpse might be easier than the lengths this was taking. His right lens was misting up again, but he daren't clean it again now. Now was the moment to which all his painful effort had led. The pilot taxied forwards to the old circle's centre, stopped the plane, stopped the engines, and wound in the singing wires of the crystallograph that sat behind them on the fuselage, mounted in an iron box. Then, with a practice jump, they were suddenly free of their harness and sitting on the edge of the cockpit itself. One, two, three, four, into the grey anonymity of a mail satchel went the crystals from the graph box. They looked like nothings now, shards of coloured rock clouded with salty fault lines. They contained recordings of the essential vibration of the weather's most violent fury, Sarazin knew. These were the final components for Minister Allied's chaos gun, the weapon which would disintegrate anything that came within the rage of its entropy beam. But still, they looked like nothing, the crystals, as they were covered in cotton wadding, strapped up tight and placed in a mailbag. Then their collector, the pilot, with minimum care, hoisted them free. With a movement more redolent of joy than fear, they kicked their legs up over the side of the craft and jumped down to the ground. With their weight, the wind buffeted the fragile plane and made it move. It slid a few feet. The pilot put one hand out onto the wing protectively, avoided the still lethal whirl of the propeller with ease, and gave the mailbag a hefty swing before letting it go. It sailed across the deck and into a bush. 
The pilot gave a nod of satisfaction that said clearly they were glad to be rid of it, however temporarily. It was heavy, so there was no chance it would be blown over the edge. Jarazin could not think about the edge. If he did, he became aware of what was at his back, and that was not worth contemplating. All the tower's safety mechanisms were long since dismantled or weathered away. It was a direct drop of 600 feet to the city streets, and if the wind caused him to miss them, it was a thousand more to the humble roads and fields of the Banner Pass. He made himself not blink, his eyelashes bent against the glass. The pilot was doing things to his craft Jarazin didn't understand, but after a moment or two, he watched in surprised admiration for the ingenuity of the machine as the wings were folded up and rolled in, the tail pushed up, and then with a good shove, the entire thing was wheeled across the one remaining hangar, eased through the door, and locked in. If he hadn't seen it happen, he would never have noticed the hangar itself, little more than one rotting workshop among many, nor believed that something like that would fit in what was essentially a tool shed with a large door. The gale rattled the doors as the pilot heaved them to and sealed their mouldering green with a heavy bar. Then, yes, they walked forwards to the bush and the bag with a strong swinging stride, clearly high on the evening's dangerous activities. Jarazine had only seconds left before they would be gone. He tried not to get his hopes up. After all, he'd been here more than 40 days in a row, and on none of those days, when they had even been present, had the pilot taken off his faceplate within viewing distance. The wind sucked at the stranger's boots, caught his scarf and tried to use it as a sail to pry him off the cliff and then it happened. The hands went up, the clasps were flicked free, the head cover pulled off and aside in a smooth gesture as the pilot inexplicably ignored the bag to turn and face the coming storm. A stream of black hair flagged out suddenly long and thick as he hung the mask on his belt and pulled off his gauntlets too and flung out his arms to the sky in a lover's embrace. Turn, turn, turn! Jarazin repeated under his breath, starting to curse the gods he'd been praying to a second before. It seemed the devils preferred him. The pilot ran his hands through his hair and shook it out. Fresh spots of rain, cold, heavy and ominous, began to land. They spattered the grey stone black in front of Jarazin and dashed themselves to death on the left lens of his glasses. One big breath then. Yes, at last, the exhilarated pilot turned and Jarazin got a clear look at this face for a single perfectly lit moment. He dropped the binoculars. They hit the rail before him and cracked a lens with a sharp retort which made him start. There was a brief, awful second in which he knew he was dead and his feet paddled the air. He grabbed for the balustrade's remains in front of him as he felt himself tip sideways. On his waist, his harness creaked and the binoculars dragged on the back of his neck as they fell to the length of the strap. If he didn't die by a fall, it would suggest a hanging. For a few moments he was a scrabbling, panicking animal, until his hands became sure the stone was not leaning but strong, and his feet found the pythons he'd taken such pain to drill into position. He pressed his cheek to the cold rock, eyes closed, and saw behind the lids that moment once again, the triumphant tearing away of the headpiece, the self-satisfied shake of the head, releasing all that coiling black hair, the utterly unexpected familiarity of that face. Trelane Huntingor heiress of an ancient but defunct line of mages, eccentric, erratic, renowned as a scientist, in the prime of her beauty at 38, mother of two daughters, the one slight, fair and scholarly, the other dark, fierce and curved like a violin. Trelane Huntingor, a woman he had seen once and never forgotten, because seeing her had made him walk into a wall. And that's all of the reading. Uh, sound effects by my cat, Pretty, who is here. And uh, we would like to say Merry Christmas to all of the customers of the Science Fiction Bookshop over there in Gothenburg. Um, thank you very much for buying my books and we hope you have a lovely, lovely winter season. Thank you.